So this is a little failure. This is the hardcover. I don't know if you can see it. Um, uh, critics agreed that the cover is the best thing about this book. It's a, it's a really good cover. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's um, um, I'm about a year and a half old. Uh, it's 1974 in Leningrad, and they had these photo studios where you could pose your child with you know the la latest in Soviet technology, you know, like a fork. Um, <laughs> And they stuck me in this car. And I was crying because I'm scared of cars. Um, so the book is really about how I became a writer. And people often ask me, how do you become a writer? You know, it's, it's a big question in Brooklyn and, 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 and Capitol Hill before the condos moved in. Um, uh, but I'll tell you the truth. And I already talked about this a little bit. But first, you've got to be asthmatic. You've got to have asthma to be a writer. Um, no way around that. So growing up in Leningrad, which is built on a swamp, was absolutely perfect. And like I said, no steroid inhalers back then, just banki, the suction cup. So um, the, the ambulance would come all the, all the time to drag me away to the hospital when I was a little kid. That's very good stuff for a writer, always thinking you're about to die. Um, and the second thing is you've got to have a grandmother who writes. And my grandmother, Galia, was a journalist for, I believe, a paper called Good Evening, Leningrad, um, which was much better than Good Morning, Leningrad, which was sort of the, the TMZ of Soviet papers. Later, they were all shot. Um, but one day, when I was five years old, she said to me, hey, asthma boy, you want to become a novelist? No? Um, and already thinking like a writer, I said, how much does it pay? Uh, and she said, I'll give you a piece of cheese for every page you write. God, I love that cheese. It's kind of almost plastic yellow Soviet cheese. And right outside of our window, as was mentioned before, was uh, the biggest statue of Lenin in all of Lang Leningrad, you know, a huge statue. We called him the Latin Lenin, because he always looked like he was going to rumba. He had this kind of <laughs> very cool look. Um, so each morning, after my first asthma attack, uh, I'd get up and I'd hug Lenin around his pedestal. Uh, I love that guy. Uh, so my first novel, as mentioned before, was called Lenin and His Magical Goose. Uh, in it, Lenin meets a, a goose, um, possibly from Armenia or Georgia. He's a talking goose. Uh, and together, they invade Finland and try to create a socialist revolution there. Um, then Lenin and the goose get into a huge political fight. Uh, the goose is Menshevik. Uh, Lenin, of course, is Bolshevik. And in the end, Lenin eats the goose. Um, <laughs> but not before we learned that Lenin also suffers from asthma. Um, so my grandmother loved it, and she paid me 100 pieces of cheese for a 100-page novel. Uh, fun fact, even today, Random House pays me in cheese. Um, <laughs> So then Jackson Vanna came along, and uh, we emigrated to America, and I had to leave Lenin behind. And I had to learn English uh, and some Hebrew, because I was sentenced to eight years of Hebrew school for a crime I did not commit, but you know. <laughs> uh, and 1980 was a difficult time to be a Russian in America. Uh, you remember all those, well, the Ronald Reagan's Evil Empire speech, and all those movies, Red Dawn, Red Gerbil, Red Hamster. Um, <laughs> I pretended to the kids in Hebrew school that I was actually born in East Berlin, not in Leningrad. You know things are bad when you try to convince Jewish kids that you're actually a German. Uh, <laughs> right? uh, and we were really poor. Uh, I had one shirt, one pair of pants, a bunch of t-shirts the parents of the local Hebrew school kids had donated. Uh, I had a, my toys were a pen and this Chewbacca action figure uh, someone had given us that was missing half of his paw. Uh, and from Russia, I had this fur coat and a fur hat made out of some woodland animal. Um, and teachers would actually take me aside and say, you really need to get rid of your fur. You know, Kids will play with you more if you're furless, uh, <laughs> which is actually true in adulthood as well, I found. Um, and then two years later, after we left Russia, something truly incredible happened that just almost changed our, almost, I should say, changed our lives forever. And I'll read you that section. In 1981, an official letter arrives in our mailbox. Mr. S. Schittgart, you have already won $10 million. <laughs> sure, our last name is misspelled rather cruelly, but cardstock this thick does not lie. And the letter is from a major American publisher, to wit, the publisher's clearing house. I open the letter with shaking hands, and a check flutters out. Pay to the order of S. Schittgart. 10 million and zero, zero slash $100. Our lives are about to change. I run down the stairs into the courtyard of our apartment complex. Mama, Papa, we won, we won. We millionaire, we are millionaires now. Calm down, my father says. Do you want another asthma attack? Huh? 
Around the glowing surface of the orange dining table imported from Romania, against all common sense, uh, we spread around the contents of the voluminous packet. For two years, we've been good news citizens, accidentally watching X-rated movies on Main Street with titles like Emmanuel, The Joys of a Woman, <laughs> getting jobs as engineers and clerk typists, learning to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and for the something for which that it stands, unavoidable with money for all. <laughs> Boże moi, my mother says, my God, as we look at the pictures of a Mercedes flying off the deck of our yacht toward our new mansion with its Olympian swimming pool. We sit down and using our collective 400 word English vocabulary, begin to unravel the many documents before us. Wait, it says here that yes, yes, we have already won the $10 million, no disputing that, but a panel of judges still has to award the money to us. So first we must fill out the winner's form and to select five national magazines that will be sent to us free, or at least the first issue of each will be free, and then the Americans will likely send us the rest of the money. Well, fair enough. You know, first we must acclimate to our new wealth, uh, expand our literacy. You know. I'm proud of Papa's new car, a bulbous 1977 Chevrolet Malibu Classic with only seven million miles on the odometer. <laughs> But it's time to get acquainted with the finer autos, so I order car and motor, motor and driver, carburetor and driver, muffler and owner. <laughs> and for the last selection, something that maybe has my Star Wars monkey, Chewy Chewbacca, in it, Isaac Asimov Science Fiction Magazine. We sign everywhere we need to, even places we don't need to. I walk solemnly to the mailbox and deposit, deposit our claim on the future. Adonai Eloheinu. I pray to our new God, please help us get the $10 million so that mom and papa will not fight so much and there will be no razvod divorce between them. That night in my dream, I walk into the Solomon Schefter School of Queens, a multi-millionaire, and the pretty girl with the big teeth who's always tanned from Florida vacation kisses me with those big teeth. I haven't gotten the mechanics of kissing down yet. <laughs> the kids make fun of Jonah Himmelstein, their school's biggest loser, but I say, hey, he's my friend now. Here's $2. Buy us both the Carvel Flying Saucer cookie ice cream and keep the change, you gurnished, you nothing. <laughs> we find out the truth quickly and brutally. At their respective workplaces, my parents are told that the publisher clearinghouse regularly sends out the you have already won $10 million letter and that these are routinely chucked into the trash by the savvy native born. Depression settles over our non-millionaire shoulders. In Russia, the government was constantly telling us lies. Weed harvest is up. Uzbek baby goats give milk at an all-time high. <laughs> Soviet crickets learn to sing the international in honor of Brezhnev's visit to a local hayfield. But we cannot imagine that they would lie to our faces like this here in America, the home of the this and the land of the that. And so we don't give up hope entirely. The judges are probably reading our application right now. Meanwhile, car and parking and the other... <laughs> that would be a great magazine, actually, car and parking, right? A magazine for parkers. <laughs> Meanwhile, car and parking and all the other publishers' clearinghouse magazines are starting to pile up taunting us with many hot naked centerfolds of the new Porsche 911, the official sports coup of Reagan era excess. We reluctantly begin to cancel our subscriptions to all of them, except for As Asimov's science fiction magazine, a small square little number with the drawing of an exciting molting space creature on the cover, hugging a boy in its claws, a boy who looks just like me. Our dreams of being instantly rich are finished, but we are moving up nonetheless. We are saving every kopeck that comes our way via my father's junior engineering job and my mother's typist job. Here's our full inventory. I have my pen, my broken Chewbacca monkey, my recently circumcised penis, the Mozart candy wrapper from Vienna Airport, and a bunch of donated t-shirts. My mother has a size two Harve Bernard business suit. My father has made a fishing rod out of a stick. Pounds of disgusting marked down farmer's cheese and kasha will feed us until we die of sadness. And if I don't clear my plate of that warm, soggy shit, the thunderclap of Papa's hand rings against my temple. My mama's screaming, don't hit his head. He's got to make money with his head someday. <laughs> or Mama's week-long silent treatment will make me consider taking my own life altogether. Who are we? Parents, we are poor folk. 
Me, why can't I have the Chewbacca with both paws? <laughs> Parents, both paws. Oh, we're not Americans. <laughs> both paws. But you both have jobs now. Yes, but we have to sa save up for a house. A house. The first step to Americanism. Who needs the two-handed Chewbacca when we can soon have our own quasi-suburban home? But at lunchtime, the Hebrew school boys do like to take out their Luke's and Obi-Wans and Yodas and set them on their desks to demonstrate just how much property falls within their purview. They talk in their already raspy Jewish voices. I threw out my old Yoda because the paint on his ears was flaking, and then I got two new ones and a Princess Leia just so Ham Solo could do her. <laughs> Me, amazed. Bow. So I wrote Lenin and his magical goose because I wanted all that Soviet cheese, but I also wanted my grandmother to love me. Um, and so a terrible connection was built in my mind that has never gone away, which is that writing novels brings love. Um, so because I was the red gerbil, the second most hated boy at Hebrew school, I thought, what if I wrote a science fiction novel and showed it to the, school, uh, the kids in school? Maybe they'll learn uh, to like me. And as I mentioned, my mother saved everything, so it exists. <laughs> yes, yes. Invasion from Outer Space is the name of it, written on, on little, like hundreds of pages of a little boy's scrawl. Let's see, chapter one. Chapter one, something is wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how do you say child welfare services in Russian? All right. Um, so, but then when I was about 11 years old, a momentous thing happened at the Solomon Schechter School of Queens, which is they got like a normal teacher. Um, and her name was Miss S. And I'll read you this, this chapter. On, our first, on one of our first days on the job, Miss S asked us all to bring in our favorite items in the world and to explain why they make us who we are. I bring in my latest toy, a dysfunctional Apollo rocket ship whose capsule pops off with the press of a lever and explain that I have even written my own novel. And this passes largely unremarked as the latest batch of Star Wars X-Wing fighters and my little ponies are paraded around. Finally, Miss S holds up a sneaker and explains that her favorite activity is jogging. P.U., a boy cries out, pointing at the sneaker and holding his nose. And everyone except me laughs their wicked child laugh. I am shocked. Here is a young, kind, pretty teacher. And the children are intimating that her feet smell. Only me and my 200-pound Leningrad fur coat are allowed to smell around here. <laughs> I look to Miss S, worried that she'll cry. But instead, she laughs and then goes on about how running makes her feel good. After we've all finished explaining who we are, Miss S calls me over to her desk. You really wrote a novel, she says? Yes, I say. It is called The Challenge. <laughs> may I read it? Yes, you may read it. I will brink it. <laughs> and brink it I do. <laughs> With the worried admonition, please don't lose, Miss S, OK? And then it happens. At the end of the English period, when a book about a mouse who has learned how to fly in an airplane has been thoroughly dissected, Miss S announces, and now Gary will read from his novel. His what? Oh, but it doesn't matter because I'm standing there holding my composition notebook straight from the Square Deal notebook people of Dayton, Ohio, zip code 45463. And looking out at me are the boys beneath their little flying saucer yarmulkes and the girls with their sweet aromatic bangs, their blouses studded with stars. And there's Miss S, who I'm already terribly in love with, but who I've recently learned has a fiance. Not sure what that means, can't be good. <laughs> but whose bright American face is not just encouraging me, but priding me on. Am I scared? No, I am eager, eager to begin my life. Introduction, I say. The mysterious race, before the age of dinosaurs, there was human life on Earth. They look just like man of today, but they were a lot more intelligent than man of today. Slowly, Miss S says. Read slowly, Gary. Let us enjoy your words. I breathe that in. Miss S wants to enjoy my words. So I continue slower. They built all kinds of spaceships and other wonders, but at that time, the Earth circled the moon because the moon was bigger than the Earth. One day, a gigantic comet came and blew up moon to size it is today. As I'm reading it, despite the misspellings, I'm hearing a different language coming out of my mouth. I do full justice to the many errors the Earth circled the moon, and my Russian accent is still thick, but I am speaking in what is more or less comprehensible English. And as I'm speaking along with my strange new English voice, I'm also hearing something entirely foreign to the squealing and shouting that constitutes the background noise of Hebrew school, silence. The children are silent. 
They are listening to my every word, and they will listen to the story for the next five weeks as well, because Miss S will designate the end of every English period as Gary novel time. <laughs> and they will shout out throughout the English period, when will Gary read already? <laughs> School is close to Long Island, so. <laughs> And I will sit there in my chair, oblivious to all but Miss S's smile, excused from following the discussion of the mouse who learned to fly, so that I may go over the words I will soon read to my adoring audience. And God bless these kids for giving me a chance. May their God bless them, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's cute, but let's move on to something not as cute. Um, <laughs> So in the meantime, because most Soviet immigrants, as mentioned, are quite conservative, I've subscribed to another little magazine called the National Review. Yeah. <laughs> William F. Buckley Jr. is the editor. Margaret Thatcher's on the cover, on every cover. Um, <laughs> and then I'm sent a thick card featuring an American eagle sitting upon two rifles. Yep. Gary Steinger at age 11 is being welcomed into the National Rifle Association. Can't start too soon. So my republicanism, republicanism <laughs> flourished even as I left the provinces of Eastern Queens and ended up at Stuyvesant High School, which is a kind of holding pen for multinational math and science nerds in Manhattan. Um, you get a number. Uh, they brand you. It's, it's complicated. Um, and there, my political allegiances underwent a change. And I'll show you exactly how it happened. So election day, 1988, I come to the Marriott Marquis Ballroom thinking this is the day the day I will finally get laid. <laughs> I have volunteered for George Bush Sr.'s scorched, scorched Earth election presidential campaign against the hapless Michael Dukakis, laughing along with Bush's racist, hysterical Willie Horton commercials and all they imply about the liberal Massachusetts Greek. Compassion, after all, is a virtue only rich Americans can afford. Tolerance, the purview of slick Manhattanites who already have everything I want. I'm invited to attend what is sure to be a Republican victory party at the Marriott Marquis, the ugly slab of a building near Times Square. The invitation to the party features a scornful cartoon of the big-eared Dukakis sticking his head out of an M1 Abrams tank, the most unfortunate photo op of that campaign. And I expect an evening of arrogant crowing, of being pressed to the bosom of my fellow conservatives while dancing a Protestant hora over the grave of American liberalism. <laughs> yes, tonight is a special night. It is the night I am to meet a Republican girl from a clean white home. Her name will be Jane. Jane Carruthers, let's say. Uh. Hi, Jane. I'm Gary Steingart from Little Neck, Queens. Uh, uh, my family owns a colonial worth $280,000 US dollars. Uh, I'm the brains behind a Commodore 64 program called the Family Real Estate Transaction Calculator. I go to high school, uh, Stuyvesant High School, where my grades aren't really great, but I hope to get into the Honors College at the University of Michigan. Uh, uh. I guess tonight is all going to be curtains for the governor of Massachusetts. He, he, he. <laughs> I'm all prepared. I enter the ballroom, a dark gap-toothed immigrant wearing sweat socks and brown penny loafers and my special and only suit, a highly flammable polyester number. <laughs> I navigate the room filled with sparkling Anglos clutching single malts without a word said in my direction, without a pair of happy blue eyes reflecting the gray sheen of the crisp nylon tie I picked up from $2 from a Broadway vendor. As George Herbert Walker Bush racks up state after state on the big screen above us, as cheers and laughter circulate around the massively hideous ballroom, I stand alone in a corner, biting down my plastic cup filled with ginger ale and swatting away the colorful balloons that seem to have an affinity for my static-inducing polyester. <laughs> until a pair of teenage blonde lovelies, the girls I've been waiting for all my life, finally approach with needy smiles on their faces, one of me beckoning to come hither with her hand. I'm so excited. I somehow fail to see myself for what I am, a short teenage boy, born to a failing superpower, trapped inside a shiny gunmetal jacket, carrying about a mop of the darkest hair in the room, darker even than Michael Dukakis's Hellenic do. <laughs> Which one will be my Jane? Which one will trace the W of my weak chin with her pewter fingers? Which one will take me on her boat and introduce me to the millionaire and his wife? You know something, Daddy? Gary survived communist Russia just so he could join the GOP. <laughs> I think that's very courageous, son. Would you like to throw the old pigskin around with me and Jack Kemp after cocktails? <laughs> just leave your topsiders in the mudroom. 
Hey, one of the lovelies says, me, debonair, unconcerned, hey. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'll have a rum and coke, uh, just a splash of ice and a lime. Mandy, you said no ice, right? Yeah, she'll have a Diet Coke, lime, no ice. I've been mistaken for the waiter. <laughs> and two weeks later, I'm a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> And that's why I'm here with you tonight. All right. Whew. All right, last section. Uh, I thought I'd just backtrack to our very first days in America. Coming to this country in 79 from the former Soviet Union, it wasn't just crossing eight time zones. Uh, it was being teleported to a different, much better planet. It felt like it was pure science fiction, uh, like there was some kind of advanced civilization. Highway overpasses stunned us, you know. Uh, there was a lot of pain involved, especially for my parents, the pain of losing language and culture and loved ones. But there was also something very beautiful about it. Um, so here's a quick little dispatch from that universe. The first momentous thing that happens to me in Kew Gardens, Queens, is that I fall in love with cereal boxes. We're too poor to afford toys at this point, but we got to eat. Cereal is food, eh, sort of, right? It tastes grainy, easy, and light with a hint of false fruitiness. It tastes the way America feels. I'm obsessed with the fact that many cereal boxes come with prizes inside, which seem to me an unprecedented miracle. It's something for nothing. My favorite comes in a box of a cereal called Honeycombs, a box featuring a healthy, freckled white kid, who I think of as an important role model, um, on a bike flying through the sky. Years later, I learned he's popping a wheelie. What you get inside each box of Honeycombs are small license plates to be tied to the, rest, to the uh, rear of your bicycle. The license plates are much smaller than the real thing, but they have a nice metallic heft to them. I keep getting Michigan, a very simple plate, white letters on a black base. I trace the word with my fingers. I speak it aloud, getting most of the sounds wrong. Michigan. When I have a thick stack of plates, I hold them in my hand and spread them out like playing cards. Each plate is so terribly unique. Some states present themselves as America's dairy land. Others wish to live free or die. What I need now, in a very serious way, is to get an actual bike. Well, it's America. So the distance between wanting something and having it delivered straight to your living room by Amazon uh, is not terribly great. I want a bike, so some rich American neighbor, they're all unspeakably rich, gives me a bike. It's a rusted red monstrosity with the spokes coming dangerously undone, but hey. I tie the license plate to the bicycle, and I spend most of my day wondering which plate to use, citrus sunny Florida or snowy Vermont. This is what America is about, choice. I don't have much choice in pals, but there's a one-eyed girl in our building complex whom I sort of befriended. She's tiny and scrappy and poor just like us. We're suspicious of each other at first, but I'm an immigrant and she has one eye, so we're even. <laughs> the girl rides around on a broken bike just like mine, and she keeps falling and scraping herself and, uh, and bawling whenever her palms get bloodied, her blonde head raised up to the sky. One day she sees me riding a, my banged up bicycle with the honeycomb license plate clanging behind me and she screams, Michigan, Michigan. And I ride ahead smiling and tooting my horn, proud of the English letters that are attached somewhere below my ass. Michigan, she cries, Michigan. With its bluish license plate, the color of my friend's remaining eye. Michigan with its delicious name, Michigan, oh Michigan, how lucky one must be to live there. Thank you. Thank you.